This is the OGM weekly check-in call on Thursday, January 6, 2022. I'm not accustomed to 2022 yet by any means. Like I, I'm not sure I ever thought I'd be alive in a year called 2022. So, so it's it's slowly sinking in that that we're doing yes. that. I, I, it's I had done to, science fiction. I, totally, and I had to address. I had to write it down on a sheet of paper recently because I date my my notes pages. And it was like, you know, one, two, two, two. And I'm like, wait, that's crazy. <laughs> so it does seem like science fiction. I remember this song in the year 2525, if man is still alive. That was what I grew up with, that song. We're that's not that end. far away. <laughs> yeah, we're not, that, we're, we're not that far away from not being alive, too. Hey, Grace. Hey, there. Nice to see you. I'm on my annual three-day review and plan time. Excellent. And do you do you isolate yourself for this, or what? What? What's your What's your custom? I usually go somewhere near the sea. And yeah, I don't isolate myself. I just take the time to think about to review my last year and to set up goals for next year and the whole thing. That sounds like a great habit. Like, mm. I don't do that. I don't. I don't actually make time every year to plan, which is dumb. But I don't actually pick a special spot where I would like to do that, which sounds even better. Um, it just gets me out of my daily routine. Um, and this year, I actually accomplished a lot less. Usually, I'm somewhere around eighty percent of what I thought I would accomplish, and this year, I was sort of more around sixty percent. Um, but there were a lot of surprises too, so a lot of bonuses. Yeah, I love that. Uh, would you like to just check in as part of uh, since we've got since we sort of started talking about stuff? Yeah. By the way, that was, uh, that was yeah. Okay. Sorry, Gil. What was that? I was saying that wasn't just a hello. That was fifty percent. Oh, fifty percent. Nice. <laughs> so yeah, so that's a that's a good place to start. I mean, yeah, it's one of the things that I do every year, um, and I should do every month is I review magic moments. So it's not just my accomplishments, but I look back at uh, if I'm doing it properly, I'm doing it every week. But if I'm you know not, I look back at so my calendar and all of my photographs from the year, and um, maybe some emails and texts, and I look at. What were the magic moments? Um, and that's really, you know, just to remind myself. And this seems like an incredibly packed year. There's things that I did this year that seem like it was three years ago. It just feels like I got so much in this year and so many different experiences. And um, I even traveled quite a bit this year, which is surprising. Mm -hmm. um, on the continent, I don't, I don't really travel by air anymore. But um yeah I, I just it was it's really satisfying to see all the areas of my life coming together and i also so i have basically when i do the review i'm going to talk about the review more than the planning but i have three sheets one is i compare what i said i would accomplish to what i did accomplish and i give it a kind of a percentage and i break it down to um four to five it's probably like five areas in my professional life and five areas in my personal life and then the sheet of the magic moments. And then the sheet of the gaps, like where do I feel like there was really a big gap? And there really was only, there were really only two places where I felt there was a gap. And one of them was big, but one of them was very small. And so it's just been amazing. And then one of the things that I felt like I didn't do enough of last year was sort of outreach, getting my name out there, but not so much my name, but really the ideas so that people can, you know, riff on the ideas, like, you know, mind viruses. And uh, <laughs> and already this year, I've had three opportunities to speak to the press and, you know, we're only on the sixth. So it just feels like, um, yeah, things are coming together. It feels really comfortable. Um, People are signing up for my workshop and I'm really not doing a lot. It's just being a clearing for something. So there's a real sense of that. And just being near the sea, I'm down here. It's funny, trying to find a restaurant is even difficult because um, all of the places here by the sea, we're about two hours from the mountains, from the Alps. 
So this time year, everybody goes to the Alps, including the people who own the shops near the seaside. <laughs> so, the seaside resorts are on vacation. They're they're like they're not expecting anybody around. Which is that's why I chose it. <laughs> that's why a lot of people and their kids making noise. It's always the week after school starts is when yeah. I do. This. So so which sea are you at? I'm at the Adriatic Sea, okay. um, the city called Piran, which is, it's a little peninsula out into the, it's just beautiful. It's like, ah, it's wonderful. Is this a repeat, a repeat visit to the same place or did you, do you pick a different place to go every time? Um, I usually pick a different place and I actually haven't, I haven't been here for my retreat. Um, so this is, this is, but it is one of my favorite places in the country to go. Sounds great. Sounds great, except for the finding food part. <laughs> <laughs> the few restaurants that are open are absolutely excellent. So the, the dearth of choices has not affected the quality of the choices. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, let's go, John Gill Doug. And there you go. Go ahead, John. Sorry. I was just trying to pull things together here before the start. Um, so what we're talking about the year. Uh, we're just checking in, so you don't need to, okay. yeah, wh whatever you'd like, it's just our normal check-in rhythm. You don't normal need to do a, okay. uh, if you feel like doing year in review, that sounds good too, but whatever yeah. you'd like. Not quite up to doing year in review, uh, something that's a little more recent, but not just since last meeting, it's something that's been building, and it's been in our discussions too. We, we, we've all talked about um, how... Um, you know, we've talked about tribalism, and I, I hesitate to use that word because it has long, bad connotations. Uh, but I've been thinking of it more and more in a good way that uh, several people have referred to this angle. Doug has referred to it a lot about how, you know, uh, <laughs> the, the people that we disagree with uh, sharply, um, they are getting something by disagreeing with us beyond the disagreement. They're getting a sense of membership, a sense of connection to other people who have some level of, it, it, it may be entirely symbolic. We might even, you know, we could, we could get cynical and say that it's, uh, they're being mutually exploitive, but let's not go there. <laughs> let's, just, let's just reflect on the fact that somehow there's some connection that's working. There's something that's saying, hey, you, you're not alone, not in that absolute sense of, you know, if, if you felt you were, you might commit suicide, but in, in that much more uh, accessible sense that, um, you know, there are people who care enough about you uh, and what you're, what's going on with you to participate in that and perhaps to, as a strategy for us, I'm going to just say us, you know, <laughs> I mean, I think we're all in the ballpark it's about a set of issues that there's another group of people who are completely set off by those issues. I have an anti-vaxxer, not, not an anti-vaxxer. I have a, I have a non-vaxxer, a concerned non-vaxxer in my family. She's connected to a larger community of that runs the whole continuum from, you know, it's, I'm not against the fact, but I just don't like the fact that I'm forced to take it. And I don't like the fact that blah, blah, blah. And I'm not, and I'm concerned and people get sick and you don't get to say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, you, you don't get to do that, that that's that, that level of concern has been delegitimated. And one of the interesting people who's sounding that kind of a note is uh, Charles Eisenstadt, who, uh -huh. you know, it's got a lot of, there's a lot of reasons to listen to Charles and to listen to what he's saying about a lot of things, you know, going all the way back to even before Occupy Wall Street, where he was saying, you know, if you, you mean were, Eisenstein or Eisenstein? Eisenstein, you're right, yeah. Eisenstein. Yeah. Um, you know, he said, if you were in the 1%, you'd be doing the same thing. And he didn't mean it cynically. He meant He meant it compassionately. He said, hey, you know, understand, understand what those people are doing and why they're doing it in a compassionate way. So that has really been coming clearer and clearer to me uh, more recently. And um, I've, it's going to reorient my, my thinking and my strategy somewhat. I mean, I'm still 
a journeyman when it comes to things like how to facilitate meetings. Um, there are people like Ken who have been doing greater work and have greater uh, recent experience in that uh, under combat conditions. But I, I'm still very focused on that, but I'm, I'm now getting more focused on this question of how do we connect in some more fundamental way with the humanity of the people that we want, that we're, we're in the same bathtub, you know? Let's, we, we, we got, we're in the same bathtub. Let's stop complaining about the water's too hot, the water's too cold. That's not where you start. It's true, but it's not where we can start. We, it's not gonna help to go there initially. We gotta go to, all right, how are you being understood and supported? And we got to open with, with something much more like that uh, if, if we're going to survive, if we're going to survive another couple of years. So that's kind of my check in. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. You, you've touched on two really strong things that I also care about that are kind of in my brain. And I was just kind of considering how I'm modeling them from what you were saying. <laughs> one, of, one of them is a, a thought I'll share real quick. Uh, which is this thought that I put in some time ago, which might be a little cynical, but it's an observation much like what you just said. Uh, Alt-right trolls uh, feel a sense of community inside their insurgency. And there's an article, The Religious Hunger of the Radical Right. Uh, this is above, is QAnon and ARG, and I've just connected it to the thought I'm, I'm curating for this call. Uh, but the idea that, that um, being part of an insurgency is, is an active community, it's exciting, uh, uh, there's a whole bunch of other things uh, about it that are very much about being part of a tribe and belonging and uh, feeling like your actions in life are worthwhile and a whole series of things like that. Uh, and then separately, um, I think Grace many calls ago uh, sort of slowed us down and said, hey, like, like there's, there's real, real reasons to take a look at, at how this is being applied and the, the psychol, and I'm, I'm totally going to reframe what you had said, Grace, and, and sort of what we're thinking here, but but there's reasons to reframe how we're thinking about the process of getting people to have a vaccine, and uh, and it should include skepticism about government and skepticism about big pharma and a bunch of other things like that in the conversation and 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 so forth. And and I'm really interested in the psychology of change and how people so how people are brought along for change and, and, and how all this stuff happens. And I'm interested in anybody else's reflections on the psychology of change. Like uh, there's a famous mayor of Bogota, uh, I think it was Bogota, named uh, Antanas Mokus, who hired mimes to basically uh, hang out. They had a lot of accidents where people were getting run over on the streets. So they hired mimes to basically uh, draw attention and slightly publicly shame through a little bit of ridicule uh, people who are doing stupid, crazy things in the street, jaywalkers, et cetera. And I'm, I'm kind of a fan of jaywalking because if you know the history of jaywalking, uh, there's, there was an attempt to move people to, to the intersection so that they would obey so that car traffic could be like more properly released. Uh, but still, you know, when people are dying, uh, can you do something that's humorous to shift behaviors, right? And, and jaywalking is less, well, jaywalking still kills people and so forth. But um, Anybody, anybody, uh, sort of, on tribalism change? Any of those kind of notes? Stuart, go ahead. Yeah, well, it's got to do with identity, um, which is such a, a a big piece. I mean, in the world of conflict resolution, um, people become identified with the cause, and to give up a cause of some kind, um, whether it's related to tribalism or some some individual stance. Um, it's almost like a near-death experience. It's like it's it's like you're you're asking people to give up their life force. Um, it becomes kind of a life force for them. So that's that's you know what pops up in 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 my mind. And change happens. Um, I think from from you know an organizational perspective, when people are given the opportunity to have real conversations about what they're feeling and what their experience is at kind of an intimate level. Not, not um, you know, when you make them the, the enemy. Um, so that's what, what needs to happen, this whole notion of, um, you know, of, of, of being able to have thoughtful conversations about what people's individual and personal um, experience is. Only from that place will people even think about um, 
taking a different stance. Love that. Um, Wendy, and then I'd love, Grace, if you would explain a little bit what egregores are to us. Go ahead, Wendy. Oh my gosh, this is such a huge, <laughs> this is such a huge topic uh, from my perspective. It, And I think what I can share that would be the most useful is, has really a lot to do with um, neural psychology, right? And how we've learned so much in the last 20 years about our neuroplasticity and how to create new habits. And I think where, where it, that intersects with the tribalism piece is why are we, is, it poses a question of why are we changing? Are we changing because we're trying to avoid something or are we changing because we're going to something? And I think it's much more compelling to talk about encouraging people to change because they're, they're moving towards something good rather than away from something, right? Because the tribalism, a lot of that is, is, is based in fear and needing to, um, needing to flock to another group of people that help us feel safe. There's a lot of science and research around that kind of piece too, how people not just, it's not just fight or flee, it's also flocking to other people. So how can we get out of the fear-based sort of mindset and move towards more of a, of a, of a community-based mindset, a listening-based mindset, right? And so the science around that has much more to do with um, recognizing that connection really forms a foundation for uh, positive learning and positive change, right? And that um, you, you, you put that together with our brain learns best, the concepts from flow and things like that, where our brains learn best when we're focused on something and we're at the edge of our learning, right? And we're enjoying what we're doing. So then gamification comes in the, in the equation here where we're reinforcing positive behaviors in ways that are not manipulative, but rather speak to people's passions and their joys and the where they want to go and the natural inclination we all have when we're not afraid and we're not defensive to want to do what's better for everyone else as long as I'm also being served and I'm not being triggered by, right? There's so many concepts in here. And I think oftentimes we are stuck kind of in our old paradigms of how do we fix what's bad instead of asking how do we create an environment that promotes these good, good um, elements of change. And I think that just even that shift in questioning and that shift of perspective could add a lot to finding the right solutions to get us out of this, right? So if you go, how can I force this person to believe what I believe is a very different kind of question than how can I guide people to do what's best for them and everybody else at the same time? Love that, thanks, Wendy. Um... Grace, a word about Egregors or however it's pronounced? It is. So yeah, I had just heard this concept this week. The film that I posted, it's, it's just it's absolutely mind blowing. Um, so the concept is something like this, that it, one of these reasons that in many cases you can say, if you believe this, you believe that, right? Like if you're an anti-vaxxer and then you also voted for Trump, like What's the connection? This doesn't make any sense. Um, and so this guy's been studying these things and he says, okay, it sounds a little like conspiracy theory, but if this idea of egregores is that we're actually cells of some larger be being, like a hive mind, you could call it like there's a hive mind, right? And then we're an element of that hive mind and that hive mind is trying to survive. It's not actually terribly different than saying that an organization doesn't change because the organization has created a culture, right? But this hive mind thing, if we're part of this egregore or hive mind, we, by definition, couldn't conceptualize it because it's like, you know, it's not like our liver is conscious that it's part of me. It's just operating as my liver. So if we are elements of this hive mind egregore thing, then, and the egregore is trying to survive, then as it shifts, we shift. And so if you, you know, uh, you know, we're aware it's January 6th, right? If you storm the Capitol and then that all didn't work out, all of a sudden you've got some completely different opinion about it. Like if you ask the people who did that, you know, like what happened, did it change or are they, whatever, that whole hive moved together towards some other explanation of things. And, and so that's the idea of this egregore that you're, when you're in it, 
whatever egregore you're in, that egregore is up, you know, it's puppeting you. And that's why you end up with these, you know, so, so from our perspective, we can talk about a sense of belonging, et cetera, et cetera. But from the perspective of the entity that we may, may or may not belong to, which we could never comprehend by definition, um, we're not free agents. So that was just conceptually really interesting. And um, yeah, and it explains a lot of things. In some ways, it's very kind of comforting, like, oh, I have to realize that if I'm trying to change somebody's opinion, I'm uprooting them from their, you know, like whatever it is from their from their garden bed and putting, trying to replant them in a new garden bed. And that, that's not a simple thing to do. Mm -hmm. Is there, are there similarities or really differences with Vonnegut's notion of the caress? I'm not familiar Okay, with so, so in Cat's Cradle, he proposes a religion called Bokanonism. And then he says that there are caresses and grand faloons. And caresses are the group you belong to, even though there's no identifying mark, you may not know what it is. And whoever, know, whoever remembers more about this, correct me in, in how I'm telling this. But, but your caress is kind of your posse, your tribe, your whatever, but it may not be very explicit. And then a grand faloon is a false caress. It's basically a uh, uh, misleading kind of, of, of group, uh, group formation uh, that, that turns negative. <clears throat> so anybody, anybody remember their Vonnegut better than me? And apparently not. That's pretty close. Cool, thanks Gil. Another notion, and I don't know if this appeared in the same place in, in Vonnegut, but there's that notion of, if there were only 12 middle names, obviously, you know, reflection of the 12 tribes, but it says there are only 12 middle names and you had to have one of those, then you could arrive in a town as a stranger and you could go to the phone book and you'd say, well, here's some people who I have some connection with, even though we have never met and I don't, we don't really know each other. And it was, I think it was both tongue in cheek as in he knew that wouldn't be enough. And at the same time, he wanted to suggest, well, why isn't that enough? You know, like, you know, something in that direction, something in that direction is needed and might be a good idea. And this is quite um, similar to why the dietary laws for Jews work. Yeah. It's like, I've got to find the butcher in this town because otherwise I can't eat because I have these dietary laws. Super interesting. Um, thank you. Uh, Stuart, go ahead. You're muted, though. I just wanted to add the kind of common or, or you know, push pull or dichotomy here that, you know, one of the only constants in the universe is change. And yet we as individual human beings resist change like like it was a plague, which it just, you know, might be. Um, so, you know, that's why that's why I think it takes a certain level of delicacy to get people to to move and change and do things differently. Um, it's interesting. Oh, good. Um, it's, it's important to resist change, though. <laughs> Unless it's not. <laughs> uh, well, you, you, ever, you ever drive a car without shock absorbers? Uh, I've, I've been in a car with really crappy shock absorbers, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. Feels I, like shit, right? <laughs> And look, I mean, the whole the whole process of of, of 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 this thing is homeostasis. You know, this this is designed to maintain itself within certain ranges of chemistry, behavior, and so forth, to maintain long term stability. You can't have too much change too fast, or you die. You can't have not enough change in the face of changing conditions, or you die. Yeah, I didn't say I didn't yes. say it was a bad I didn't say it was a bad thing, Gil. I just said that's the you know the interesting yeah. push pull about the phenomenons that we're talking about. Yeah. And um, yet you could argue that constant change is always happening inside the body. Yeah. Chemical right. processes and other things that also, if we're not happening, would the mm -hmm. body would die. That's right. And and also, um, I just I just from this conversation, I'm connecting two off two different thoughts in my brain. One of them is resistance to change, which we just brought up, <clears throat> but the other one is that people are incredibly adaptable. We are constantly changing in the face of something inconvenient, something in our way, uh, the lack of something, whatever. And we're like, ah, okay, I'll just modify. And and we do considerable change constantly around the world, and then we take for granted the resulting setup, and 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 we don't 
we don't actively go back and necessarily correct it when the pressure goes away, things like that, which, which, which is kind of adapt a lot. And one of the problems with humanity is that sometimes we adapt a lot to situations that are actually quite toxic and dangerous and difficult. Uh, and instead of going back and fixing them and paying attention, we're like, well, I guess this is the new normal. And I, I think that that's, uh, that's a piece of the dynamic as well. Uh, Doug, then Julian. Yeah, uh, one of the things about the people on the right or the anti-vexers, that whole collection, is not just their tribalism, which is real, but the fact that they also have an analysis of what's going on, which we don't pay enough attention to. Uh, the sense in which they feel like the life they thought they had is coming apart uh, is deep and real, because it is. And so we have to pay attention to the belief systems as well as to the tribalism. Agreed. Totally. Thanks, Doug. Um, Should I leave from that directly into my check-in? Would that be all right? Uh, let me let me uh, let me get Julian into this this piece of the conversation. Then we'll go back to you for, for then we'll go back to Gil for check-in. Um, just a comment, Doug. What you described about the tribalism of those folks uh, applies to us too. Of course. Yeah. Same game. Cool. Um, Julian? Uh, with respect to change, I was going to bring up the parable about the, the frog in the pot of boiling water. In, in other words, change happens whether or not humans like it. And the other thing is I still want to know what happens about driving a car without shock absorbers. <laughs> it's it's <not> uncomfortable. <laughs> Um, so, by the way, uh, uh, Jim Fallows wrote a piece not, uh, debunking the boiling frog myth, which is quite fun. Uh, but there's a whole, uh, let me just do a quick screen share. There's a whole back and forth about the boiling the frog. Uh, and, then, and then there's a series of articles in the Atlantic, peace on the boiled frog front, the boiled frog myth, hey, really knock it off. The boiled frog myth, stop the lying now. Uh, and then somebody, uh, I think this is uh, uh, Steve... Yeah. Uh, oh, this is Brad DeLong, in which James Fallows is a frog stepping on a global warming water, carrying a hockey stick, etc. So there's a there's a kind of a cute uh, dead end uh, over there. You know, if we substitute human for frog, it would still it would actually be true because you think about humans who are missing that change is going on very very gradually, and suddenly ten years later they realize, hey, when did this happen? And, so I think by deduction, you're saying that frogs are way smarter than humans. I know my cat's smarter than me, so no, that's I, good. I, I think we're saying that some stories are true, even if they're not true. Ah, love that. Uh, so back to our check-in round. Let's go Gil, Doug, Wendy. Um, golly, um, so many things here. So the hundredth monkey uh, story too takes the same beating if you, if you, if you dig into the science behind it. <clears throat> but it's a useful story. Um, oh, golly. Um, I, post, I think I posted something in the group yesterday called An Inconvenient Truce, uh, which is worth reading around this process of tribalism and change. And it's from a, a site called Epsilon Theory, which is ostensibly an investment site, but really is uh, probing a lot of the kind of questions we're interested in. <clears throat> and it basically uses the metaphor of medieval fortifications to unpack the games of critical race theory, COVID and the insurrection um, and tribalism. Uh, and, um, and, the, and, and a phrase that echoes through the article is that they want us to fight. And it basically asserts that we as human populations are a lot less far apart on most things than we think we are, but the game is designed to polarize us. Um, and it's a, it's a fascinating article. It's, it starts with the story of the Christmas truce from 1914, which I think most people are familiar with. Uh, and it says, notably, that wasn't the only time that happened. It happened in, 1915, in 1915 and 1916, and in many places and many wars around the world. But the generals really don't like this. So they suppressed the stories, number one. And number two, uh, often designed uh, military initiatives and bombardments and so forth around Christmas Eve so that their soldiers wouldn't have the opportunity to see the humanity on the other side. Wow. And it goes from there into the orchestration of polarization uh, around these critical issues. He doesn't do climate, but you can construct a similar story around that. So I would encourage people to have a look at that. I'm still digesting it, but found it really, really rich. Um, and, and the metaphor is that um, there was some, there, in medieval fortifications, there was the model and the bailey. There was the fortification and there was the town outside the fortification. Uh, and so you could do a staged withdrawal in the face of conflict. 
Uh, and the analogy that this uh, Russ, uh, what's his name is saying is that um, um, the game around things like anti-vax is put out in a really extreme position. Uh, and then when people jump on you for the extreme position back up to the more reasonable position, which is like, we have concerns about vaccine safety, which is a fair question to ask because it's a rapidly introduced thing. And then thank you, it keeps coming back to the, you know, the strange attractor. That's maybe one of the most powerful things that we have to play with here. Um, <clears throat> So number one, um, we're doing check-in, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Grace, I appreciated what you shared. I've, I've tried to do that every year. I did more of it this year than in previous years. I kind of get waylaid uh, somewhere through the process. Um, um, uh, I found that lately I'm very much aware of what didn't happen, of what was missing, the intended and the accomplished list and the gaps between them is very present to me. Um, but I just did a quick review as listening to you and thought, no, actually there's, you know, there's a lot of accomplishment that I sort of miss in the attention to the gap. So thank you for that reminder. Um, um, what that's led for, to for me right now is a um, really powerful exercise in extreme focus, uh, realizing that if I'm gonna do what I wanna do in the world, I need to really narrow my game sharpen my game, dial in the focus much more sharply. I took a lead from, uh, from Ken. You joined the Ken Homer movement. I joined the Ken Homer movement. I don't know if Ken is boycotting OGM for January too, but I, I went off Facebook a few days ago. Um, and uh, this week has been hugely more productive than any week in recent memory. Um, and I miss people. Um, I'm doing, you know, but I'm, I'm actually spending more time on LinkedIn, which is probably more professionally productive for me. Um, but more time with me thinking and just really cranking. And what I'm mostly cranking on, I've talked about this before, but I've been, I've sort of been carrying around um, this idea for 10 years or more. Actually, it's, the idea has been carrying me around uh, to build a new kind of investment fund, to do private equity for good. Uh, and to use the tools of private equity, not to buy companies and strip them of their assets and leave a smoking shell on the landscape, buy companies- Not, not to put too, too fine a point on that one. Not to put that uh -huh. point, but to, yeah, buy, that's great. but to buy companies focusing on the silver tsunami um, uh, and um, green the shit out of them, which improves their operating margins, refocus their strategy around purpose and climate and circular, um, bring all the tools of, um, of more human and dynamic coordination from entrepreneurship to language action to open books management into how the company operates and then exit not by selling to a private equity firm or doing an IPO, but by selling to the employees who now own the company and have been brought up to capacity to have run you, it well. Have you heard the term exit to community? I have. I just got off a call with Kevin Doyle and a bunch of other folks. Was Kevin, Kevin was here, I guess. Yes. Are you here, Kevin? I can't see on the screen. Uh, he, yeah, he's here, yeah, but yeah, his yeah, icon yeah, is muted. They're in the, they're in the leaf litter. Uh, so there's a lot of activity in this realm. Um, I'm wanting to marry the, the, the green and the co-op and the silver tsunami. Um, I've got a partner who's uh, got a successful track record running funds. We're going to do this as a two-stage. First fund will be um, um, a portfolio of companies that meet certain criteria. Um, me going through filters of, of, of energy, mobility, built environment, uh, and um, food and ag. Talk to Klaus about that later. Um, my partner has a, a track record of 18% per year return for years using a financial radar to identify companies that are whose value is down and who is likely to come back up. And so our hypothesis is that if you put those two together, something very interesting happens. That'll be fund one. And fund one will be the farm team for fund two, from which we can pick some of those companies to actually acquire controlling interest in as well as sourcing from other places. Kevin's been focused a lot on community economics uh, and place-based uh, business development strategies. This could very much tie in with that, but we'll see how it goes. Um, and I am uh, seriously jazzed. Um, I've uh, put, uh, got a pretty good draft first deck. I have a one page from six months ago that I haven't touched that I need to re-up uh, and then we'll start walking this around. 
Um, what that's meant is that, yeah, Facebook is bye-bye for a while. Um, the thoughts of building a bunch of courses is bye-bye. The thoughts of continuing consulting business is probably bye-bye for a while. I think I'm going to do fund and coaching uh, and not stuff that requires deliverables, commitments to clients. Um, and um, that's, uh, that's my new year. Pretty interesting. That sounds awesome. That's yeah. a, like, how can we help you get those things done? Sounds great. Um, um, those of you who are interested uh, could, you know, could review the docs once I have them. <clears throat> those of you who know people might want to invest, introduce me. Um, in particular, if you know people who are refugees from Wall Street, hedge fund private equity experience who want to do good shit with their lives. Uh, and even more particularly, if we do go into the turnaround business, which, you know, which, which is the plan here, uh, we're going to need really skillful, experienced managers to bring into companies to help do the work uh, and not private equity hatchet job managers, but people who are sensitive to relationship and community and cooperative and so forth. Has anybody uh, coined the phrase green around yet? The word green around? No, but can I have that? Sure. All yours. <laughs> You could call it the Green Around Fund. Yeah. We're, we're calling it Critical Path Capital for now. Uh, green Around, we'll see. We'll, we'll put, I'll put Green Around into the back. <laughs> cool. Uh, thanks, Gil. Let's go, uh, Doug, Wendy, Stewart. What's been on my mind this week is the idea that it's a question. Can humanity think its way out of the problem that we're in? Uh, and the problem <laughs> is not only climate, but it's the oceans, it's our institutions, the health, education, money, uh, the way business operates. Uh, if you look at where we are as a society, it's the sum of many billions of little decisions that people have made over the centuries. Uh, and it's an extremely complex culture of a woven tapestry. Now, that tapestry is leading to our demise. So the question is, is there any way that thought could be integrated in such a way across the globe that it would be adequate to dealing with the situation that we're in? So it's really saying to my surprise that thinking about thought might be one of the most important things to do. Can you repeat that last part? That thinking which thought? Thinking about thought is one of the most that. important things we can do. Could you go a little deeper on that, Doug? Well, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I can. Uh, it's so striking that we have people saying things like, uh, let's think of how to do better without realizing that probably to get to better, things have to fall apart, some first which means huge social costs uh, and confusion and the need for new forms of welfare. But people aren't thinking through that way. Uh, people are, uh, most people who are thinking are thinking in silos still. Uh, they're thinking that how do you change society without things changing? Uh, they want the institutions to stay pretty much the same. Uh, they're not up for giving up uh, living in private houses, for example, or flying in planes. So I would, argue that the last, I would argue that the last electoral cycle was very much about a bunch of people saying, we need to destroy the system in order to reinvent the system. And we're willing to send a fire ship into the system to do so. And that didn't have to do with, hey, we need to stop driving cars and burning fossil fuels. Okay, so remember that, that I said that we've got to look at, at the belief of the people on the right. And it's true that in many ways, they are more systemic uh, than the progressives. Right. Um, I'm on board with that. Anybody else? Um, cool, let's go Wendy Stewart, Kevin. So I've been, I, I enjoyed the break um, and really gave myself a, a chance to um, think more creatively and uh, dive into what I want my role to be in these conversations and in my work for 2022. And what's interesting is I, I, I have resisted for the last, say, year and a half, and even more so as I met people, building something. 
um, it has been very hard to resist building something because there's pressure to have a book or you know build the website or what is it that you do right that's kind of a common thing in our culture and yet I feel so strongly about not creating another silo of something that then it needs to be integrated in some way um, that I think I ended the year really getting some clarity on. I think the best role that I can play is in weaving more and more. And, and what does that mean, right? Because we've been talking a lot about that too. So what does that mean, the weaving part? And so I started to think about what is it that we need? And we already touched on this in our conversation today about envisioning, right? Envisioning the positive and our whole conversation about better verse was about that too. And I started thinking more about that and discovering really um, in, in my efforts to create visual technology in a new way that can inspire, I was struck with the same conundrum of, I need the thing that I wanna build because to build the thing is so new and so complicated that I kind of need the thing I wanna build to build the thing that I need. And this is a chicken and egg thing that I've been playing with all year. So, okay, let me break that apart. So all of these threads started to speak to me in a new way of, how about envisioning two things, not just one thing, envisioning where we could potentially go if we waved a magic wand and technology was no, in, was no limitation and change was easy and right, where, what kind of universe would we wanna live in? What does that better verse look like? Let's start throwing stuff up against a wall and seeing what sticks, right? What are the cornerstones? What are the, main features without thinking about the limitations of getting to those things. And then the other envisioning is what are the next, what's the next one step or two steps or three steps. So that started to, to manifest in my mind as, Hey, wait a minute. Some of it's re researching, like kind of researching into the field, researching to see what's potentially coming up for the long term. And the other is who's actually applying some of those new concepts right now. And how is that working? How is it rippling? How is it affecting? How is it creating immediate, more immediate changes, which are the next two, three, four steps, right? So I'm, I'm now seeing both things being important as we need a long-term view of where this vision is going and we need a shorter ter term. Here are the organizations and things that are starting to do it. Um, and, and I started to create a categorization framework based on... Um, Freed would be happy based on uh, Barbara Marks Hubbard's wheel of co-creation, just using those sectors because they're used in so many, and I know they're echoed in a lot of other uh, frameworks as well as being a community version of where of the, it, as a way to organize where we need to go and who is starting to apply the concepts. So if we're talking about economics, What's the ideal version? Who, who's describing the ideal version of economics that we'd love to get to one day? And then who's actually trying to do that in some way, shape or form, even if it's just a little slice or it could be the bigger picture, it could be, right? So that we can start to see what it is because I realize those are two different things. And then something else is two different things is you've got the community thing uh, framework. And then we also need a personal framework because we have our own personal journey towards things. So sometimes organizations and people are, I'm sorry, organizations and concepts are really for an individual to either further themselves or find their way in the world or find where they best fit or, right? And sometimes it's really about an organization doing the same thing, an organization finding itself and figuring itself out and doing things differently or a system. So I realized there was a natural split there too. So I'm starting to play with um, cataloging, weaving, putting down on paper and wondering if these categories now are the right categories or not, do things fit in? And as things fit in, it validates for me that these are, these are decent categories to use. And I would prefer to use categories that have been well thought through by other people that have been around for a while than to try and come up with new ones on my own. So um, that's kind of where I've been. Um, on the creative side, um, thinking about the weaving of our sovereignty, again, that, that personal side of the journey with the community side of the journey, I'll share with you guys um, the latest image that I've been messing around with. Um, and I lost track of it. Oh, I closed it. Hold on one second. Is it in a browser? <laughs> or did it just go to history? But it's probably not 
No, it's there. I just gotta. Okay. One second. Yep. I just had to open it up again. And get back to hit the share button. Here we go. So I, I sat down to think about what's wisdom. How do we get there? How do we weave? And, and instead of doing a chart, <laughs> I guess I thought I was going to do a chart. I ended up drawing a picture. And then I um, used a mapping software actually for fantasy <laughs> or fantasy games and D&D &D and stuff uh, that my daughter had to create this image out of it. So this is the personal version of our own path with the path in the middle being kind of what we're set with originally, the beliefs, information, culture, knowledge, stories that are given to us. And then we start to wind our own version um, of, of wisdom, uh, threads and, you know, inspiration in the form of the sparkles and finding out our own weavings of gems and nuggets of knowledge and um, out of the darkness comes a better understanding of ourselves. So it's kind of all, all in there. And I was just, I, I, I've been playing with that. And then there's a, I'm going to, uh, work with someone to do a 3d model. To me, this was the individual person and then kind of in a calculus fashion, um, repeating that a million times with, you know, or, or infinitely, um, with a bunch of people, if you spiral this on an, on an, on a vertical axis, you end up with a, a 3d picture that looks different. And so that's kind of next for me. And I'm, I'm starting to, I think that's going to end up finding its way back into an image that we can use that'll help uh, create a, a vision for the future, but who knows, it was fun to make in the meantime. So. <laughs> I love the look of it. Is the moon in chains? <laughs> Those are roots. That's interesting. Um, I, read, I, read, I read chains first too. And then I realized they're the roots of the tree that's above. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. But I, but I read chains too, Wendy. It uh, visually. Yeah, and and I shared it with another group recently, and they and someone else said chains. To yep. me, that was more like Celtic knots. Yep. Mm -hmm. I can go there. Yeah. You can yeah. you can Not you first. can fiddle with it a little and shift the focus a little bit. Yeah. We still I think if I reduce the contrast, even in the image, it would probably improve the the how it reads. And also on the roots, if the roots got thin, even thinner toward the end, they wouldn't read as chains because chains are usually consistent, mm. you know, uh, width, et cetera. But, but visually, it looks like they're kind of, except for the thicker trunk at the top, which is part of my, my clue. Yeah. Um, but I love the, the, the diagram and thank you for sharing it with us. And yeah. I posted a couple of things in the chat. One is Indra, the concept of Indra's net might be really interesting. Uh, of sort of jewels hanging in the net and the jewels are sort of wisdom. It's a little bit like the glass bead game ish sort of sort of idea about about knowledge and 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 how we can share it and then i posted also a video that i did long ago why i do what i do where i riff on yin and yang because one of my, one of the parts of my thesis is that we've been suffering from a yang overdose for somewhere between 300 to 3000 years yeah uh, and that we're in an era of the rebalancing of yin and yang right now and if we handle that with care, we actually get somewhere really good. So I love your use of yin and yang here. Yeah, and that just that just came out. I actually don't know a ton about yin and yang, but I do know plenty of other people who've written on that and um, that have talked about how we're the pendulum swinging back in the other direction. Yeah. So I used yin and yang in a speech I did for Uppsala, the Object Oriented Programming Association, many many years ago, and I think the speech is online. I'll find a link to that too. Um, and after the speech, a young lady came up and very, very politely said, I think you meant that yin is the feminine energy and yang is the mat because I'd flipped them. I was just like putting it up there. And so then I was like, oh, I, I got to read up a little bit here. Um, but uh, love that. Anybody else thoughts on this? Uh, Scott, jump on in. Um, the thing I learned most about this that uh, was that the, the center line is actually the path. So mm -hmm. from Tao, Tao is the path and the path is the line. So we, we think about it as two shapes that are together, but it's actually the line in the center where you are supposed to be. That's where you're in balance because if you're following that, that line. Um, so it's just something to think about because it's, it's the shape that isn't there in a sense, you know, cause you have these two pieces and it's like, oh yeah, it's, Everybody knows the light and the dark, the up, the down, the you know, day, night, all that. But I haven't run into anyone yet 
who already knew well on the street had 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 known that that uh, path was there, and I didn't know that until a couple of years ago. Okay, so that's really fascinating because I didn't know that either. But you drew it. I didn't know that intellectually, but that's what I drew. Mm -hmm. Right? How fascinating! And so then, if you spiral it, so you're you're not going to get a clean picture, but you might also you might all be kind of interested in this now. The path becomes an infinity. Mm -hmm. And so infinite, the infinity part uh, brings to mind for me immediately polarity management. Are you familiar with that? Hmm. So, so you were when you began talking, you were talking about uh, envisioning a future that we want and then who is doing stuff immediately now. And I was like, oh, polarity management, because polarity management says when, when you're facing a situation where things are kind of binary, this or that, really often you're just talking about opposite ends of a polarity. And you can manage polarities very creatively by just going back and forth in an infinity loop. And so what that means is if your team is like, we have to plan for the future. No, we need to do stuff right now. You say... I'm making this up. Hey, this month, we're going to take a really long-term look. And then next month, all you people who need to get busy, we're going to come back into this part and, and, and do the near-term stuff. And so, and so partly this, this walk back and forth, and then I wish Neil Davidson were on this call uh, because he's got all sorts of models that kind of build on this as well in, in terms of you know, elaborating on the, on the different kinds of loops. Yeah, and last night I, I, I sensed into the same thing. It just kind of came to me late at night where the infinity... I mean, I've, I've come to this in a couple different ways before, but, but it came with this new language that I was starting to play with of, of sensing out into the field and then applying it back, right? Which is exactly what you were saying. So um, yeah, of that polarity. And I think um, the other ways I've used it before in the past are I used to do uh, parenting workshops. And so we would talk about emotions and how the, the center point um, you're, you'd swing out and how the dynamic system of a family or a dynamic system of anyone with emotions, if you, if you, um, if your child is getting completely like unruly right before bed and you try to swing the other direction to, um, say, no, this is, it's time to go to bed. The, the, the polarity that's created there will actually encourage your child to balance it by going further into crazy. But if you get playful for a little bit, it actually kind of helps everything come back into the center. So um, just cool. interesting how all that stuff kind of plays in here. It's like an Aikido bedtime strategy. I love that. Because uh, Aikido is <laughs> all about blending energies. Um, Doug, then Sam. I just want to uh, know the name of that software, please. Oh, the software you used to draw that, Wendy. Can you type that in? Can you give us a link in the chat? Perfect, thanks. Uh, go ahead, Doug, then Sam. Uh, Doug, you're muted. Thank you. Yep. Uh, yin yang comes from uh, yin meaning the uh, dark side of the hill and yang meaning the bright side of the hill. And the idea is to use the entire landscape. So there's not a path that can be discerned through it. The idea is to use all of it uh, and to feel the freedom of moving into the dark and into the light and continually getting a synthesis but not trying to reach out of, to pull out of it a solution. Thanks, Doug. Um, Samuel. Yeah, um, well, you know, it's funny and now that I listed everyone, most of what I was gonna say is, has been said. That happens sometimes. But, but you know, one, one thing when, while listening to you, when you had this graphic up and you were talking about it, um, you got me thinking that like a lot of people when they see this, they apply it to themselves as like, you know, this is, I want to bring balance to myself, but usually in life we're 99% or more involved with other people. And probably the balance ends up being a interdependency instead of like somehow you can't like in isolation, bring balance to yourself without taking in the environmental context. And the example that you gave, is the thing that you talked about with putting your kids to bed is exactly what happens to me every single night that I put my kids to bed. <laughs> and I never really even thought about the, the strategy that you mentioned. Um, but we just, sometimes we just try anything, just random stuff, just to see if we can shake up the dynamic. Um, but anyway, it makes me, you got me thinking that really it's like, maybe it isn't meant to be an individual improvement thing. And maybe it's meant to think, be thinking about how you can bring balance to 
the interdependence between people. I love don't, that. I don't know though, really. You tell me. <laughs> love that. Thank you. Um, Stuart, you were holding your hand up and you're also next in the queue. So uh, whichever, if you'd like to jump in. And you... Great. I, I, I'll, I'll jump in and, um, and check in because what, what I want to say, I think, um, speaks to all of it. Um, I wanted to punctuate what Wendy was saying and what you validated, Jerry, this notion of moving um, the masculine to the feminine and, and how, how critical it is. You know, the demographic of this call is not lost on me looking around um, at the screen. Um, but, you know, the, the male, uh, um, in some ways, biological drive to, to, to thrust forward uh, has, has, you know, look at where it's got us over the last, you know, Jerry, you threw out 3,000 years. I just think that's just so important to consider. And it, 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 it reminded me of being seven guys out of a group of 37 on a, on a spiritual journey and us coming to the conclusion that we needed to be fierce in our femininity, um, fierce in our femininity. Right, exactly. But <laughs> that was that was kind of what we came up with. And we didn't we didn't mean <laughs> Grace, I see you grimacing over there. <laughs> 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 you know, it was the best metaphor that we could describe. It mean we needed to make sure that we 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 held that value and way of being strongly. Um I, I want to comment also, we moved along too quickly on what Doug's, Doug said in his check-in about thinking about thinking. Um, I, I think that that's just such a critical piece. Um, what is it that people are thinking? And where that took me was the notion of um, how many people are um, have the capacity to really think about their own thinking. Because th that's, that's in some ways what drives everything. It drives individual action, it drives communal action to be aware of what you're thinking and how that thinking results in, 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 in action. Um, I, I did a little bit of work with Robert Keegan on adult development theory. And I think it's, it's only about 10% of the population that is what he, he, he calls self-transforming, meaning has the capacity to actually change themselves because of reflection on their thinking. Um, I, I just wanted to throw those two things out about how important that is, right? So um, moving into my, my, my own personal check-in, I spent a, a week on retreat. Um, it was rather a luxurious retreat at a spa in, in Mexico, just across the border uh, in, in to, near Tecate. Um, and I just unplugged from um, all media feeds and kind of let myself, you know, engage with uh, exercise and hiking and 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 um, and that 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 kind of stuff. Um, and that was really good. It also, you know, gave me some time to think. Um, and I continue to um, be enthused about my large poetry collection of 365 poems, uh, one day, uh, one poem a day with reflective questions, um, you know, modeled after Mark Nepo's Book of Awakening. Uh, I'm writing my way through, you know, how we get to where we are, to where we might like to be. And it's been an interesting progression. Um, so I wrote this 30 page overview and, you know, outlined 37 areas that need attention. Um, and then I said, well, I can't possibly write this. And then I started writing it. <laughs> so uh, the writing is a little bit shorter for each chapter, but that's okay. And then I'm gonna start layering um, dialogue onto it and put characters because this is really meant to be an episodic um, TV show at some point in time that, that, that hopefully will have value. Um, I was really moved, I'm really being moved a little bit by two things now, a book called um, Ministry of the Future. Um, it's a wonderful piece of, of um, science fiction and the movie Don't Look Up, 
which I thought was just an extraordinary um, Hollywood representation of how unconscious <laughs> most of the leadership in the world is. And I thought that they did it in a, in a, in a wonderful way. It had mixed reviews. Um, if anybody hasn't seen it, you know, see it. I think that the reviewers that didn't like it just didn't get the message and thought it was just, you know, a comedy. So um, there are very my... reviews of the reviewers that are worth seeing. <laughs> it's it's striking. It's it's I, people always disagree about movies. I've rarely seen something where the disagreement was so fiercely polarized as around this one, which I think is pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Gil. So that's my that's my that's my that's my my check in one, you know, uh, one 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 step in front of another, uh, one day at a time. Um, I think that's the kind of the time span that we're in, and um, practicing a whole bunch of non attachment. Mm -hmm. Love that. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, let's go, Kevin Michael Julian. Except Kevin just had to drop off because it's the top of the hour, I think. So that was a near miss. I, sh I should have put him in the queue a little earlier. Uh, let's go, Michael, Julian, uh, Stacy. Uh, um, just uh, drinking in that moment of um, of knowing I'm next in the queue and have somebody's whole. Uh, check in to, to prepare, and then suddenly I'm not <laughs> having that one. Um, so, um, I, I've had a, a, a really nice and reflective um, break over the holiday, um, and, uh, you know, some, some similar thoughts to Wendy's about, you know, about siloing um and trying to figure out how to weave together um what i'm doing with what other people are doing how to support other people in doing what they're doing um and uh and it's interesting i i was just um dming gill a, a lot of what i've been thinking about is is generational in a way i mean silver tsunami related um in that i feel like so many of the mores of the digital world were um you know the the boomers and even gen xers played catch up too um and you know like oh oh, oh i can i can play this i can do this and you know ended up being leaders in their way but in a game on the social media front that was defined the rules of which were defined by people who were younger than them more uh exhibitionist than them um and um and the more I, I don't mean to generalize about entire generations but I think there are many um, and there are many in this group included in this that are you know, more, more thoughtful and introspective and, and deliberate about um, what they want to do and um, how they want to accomplish things, even, even while wanting to work speedily, you know, doing it with, with conscience and thought and, and um, and collaboratively and less free, freelancerly. That's, I know that's not a word. Um, and how, how to enable those people to participate and reassert and, and share their knowledge and experience and background with a lot of the, with a lot of, you know, I was um, deeming Gill about a friend of mine who's who's got a background in in private equity, um, and there are many you know refugees from fields that 
have not been governed by the the the, the right interests and and need a green around um, and uh, how to draw on their knowledge, empower them, um, you know, bring them into a new kind of, kind of conversation. I mean, I think it's, it's very much what we've all been talking about without specifically talking about the, the generational aspects of it. Um, and I, I've been focusing that, on that a lot and talking to people who are older than I am, as well as, you know, constantly trying to keep up with people who are younger than I am. Um, yeah, just wanted to throw that out there and uh, that'll do it for me for now. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for checking in. Uh, let's go Julian Stacy Samuel. Uh, before I check in, I just wanted to mention that my response to something like OK Boomer or anything like that has been uh, Boomer's invented that thing in your hand. So what, what have you done? Uh, nice comeback. <laughs> I'm, my, sure that, I'm sure that earns a lot of respect. Yeah, I'm an old cantankerous codger. What do I care? That's the uh, uh, my check-in is that over the uh, holiday break, I got funding dangled in front of me. And, you know, for some time I've been talking about this grand idea of uh, changing how humans interact with technology. And now with uh, actual possibility of funding in front of me, I've been spending the last few days focusing on writing it up somehow and figuring out how to properly demonstrate it to the point of uh, getting other people to, to uh, grok it. So that's my check-in. So. That sounds awesome. Uh, Godspeed on that. Um, uh, Stacy Samuel. So I was going to use my check-in to share a poem that really meant a lot to me. And at first I was a little nervous because I didn't know how it would land for people here. But as a carrier of hope, I want you to know that there are a lot of people that this poem resonates with. So it's called, um, hold on, I have to get it because <laughs> now this chat just covered where I had it set up. Bad chat, okay. bad. <laughs> it's called For a New Beginning. In out of the way places of the heart where your thoughts never think to wander, this beginning has been quietly forming, waiting until you were ready to emerge. For a long time, it has watched your desire, feeling the emptiness growing inside you, noticing how you willed yourself on still unable to leave what you had outgrown. It watched you play with the seduction of safety and the gray promises that sameness whispered, heard the waves of turmoil rise and relent, wondered, would you always live like this? Then the delight when your courage kindled and out of you stepped onto new ground, your eyes young again with energy and dream, a path of plentitude opening before you. Though your destination is not yet clear, you can trust the promise of this opening. Unfurl yourself into the grace of beginning that is at one with your life's desire. Awaken your spirit to adventure. Hold nothing back. Learn to find ease in risk. Soon you will be home in a new rhythm, for your soul senses the world that awaits you. And that's from John Donahue. And I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you, Stacy. That's great. And and somehow timely and <clears throat> really good for the start of the year and the end of the year and all of those kinds of things. Uh, Samuel Scott Mark. Hey, everyone. <clears throat> Happy New Year to everyone. Um, yeah, I've, I've been I've been going through a lot of changes over the last two or three weeks. Um, finishing my positions with a lot of the projects that I was working on. So I'd started a new business in December. <clears throat> That's pretty much the same business I had, but with a different name and doing some different stuff in it. Um, and I'm just really in a time of massive change here. And then mostly, frankly, keeping my head down, doing tons and tons of work and learning, um, I do a, a combination of software engineering and research and understanding the domain 
of things. Like if I have to understand the economics of things or complex system science or whatever, uh, you know, when I work with people, <clears throat> the work that I do does involve software and data analysis, but it also involves modeling and understanding what they're doing. And so I'm, I've been very active doing that. And uh, in, I, I still anticipate throughout 2022 being deeply involved in re regionalizing food systems and attracting investment to recreating local and regional food systems in the Midwest area that I live in. Um, so that's, that's my update. It's kind of a generic one, but that's, that's what I'm involved in. And, and, but I'm shifting from working with the not-for-profit to working with some people that are actually going to be doing the work on the ground and putting in controlled environment, agriculture and aquaponics and so on. Um, and I, once I get underway, I'll, if I, when I rejoin you all, um, I can try to give more information on that. Um, anyway, that's me. Mm, thanks, Sam. That sounds great. That sounds super interesting. And some days we're doing what we do and, 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 you know, it, it sounds like, it sounds like you're immersed in stuff that you care about a lot that, you know, feeds your soul, feeds, feeds your brain, all those kinds of things. So can't ask for more. Can, can I just throw out does for anyone else, did that remind, did Samuel's check-in remind you of Klaus and his work too? So if you guys don't know each other, you would, it would probably be really rich for you guys to connect with each other. I, you know, I had, um, through the instigation of Kevin Jones, I have communicated with Klaus behind the scenes and I have a standing offer to him to do that kind of work. And he was very interested in it, but he's been in the process of building up the ability to be ready to do that, to do the work that I do. Um, so, but yes, I would love to help Klaus uh, map and model and be able to, you know, kind of make the investment in business cases for the, for everything he shared. Um, that's pretty much exactly what I've been doing over the past two years. So it would, it would be a good fit. You're totally right. <laughs> um, but we, I did happen to talk with him behind the scenes about that. And so once, once he's ready, I'll, you know, definitely be glad to help him do that. Love that. Yeah. Good point, Wendy. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes, sometimes, I'm sorry, just one other thought. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's important to continue to weave the people who are so busy doing what they're doing that they forget that there's someone else who can help them out, right? And they, and we tend to have a, oh my gosh, I have to do everything. And so lately I've been thinking about, right, how can we be the funnel? Some of us could be the funnel to continue to help remind those, oh, you don't need to build a new flat platform, Trove exists. Oh, you don't need to do all the data collection. You know, someone else is there to help with that and uh, to start to, to bring that together. We're not in the same company, but in that same way of going, there are resources here available. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the last little bit that I'll add is that what Klaus proposes to do from what I've studied in, in the food systems and, and the impact in the environment, what he proposes to do could have some of the greatest impact in making a difference like right now. And that's the area that he's targeting produces a huge amount of the food that's consumed in a minute. And that's also exported to um, the rest of the world. So it's, it's actually quite, a, it, it could make a big difference if he can, if they can succeed with that project. And a huge amount of greenhouse gas and, and there's like five different wins in that nexus. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's yeah. a, which is, which is why Klaus is, completely on fire about about getting this done it's lovely um thank you uh, scott and mark hey everybody um i just thought i'd pop in say hello my stuff is as i've said for the time that i've been part of this group which is on and off for a year and a half or so my stuff is never so grandiose. I'm not changed, trying to change the world unless I say that world is what I can see around me. So maybe that is the world, who knows. Um, I'm suffering from a wealth of opportunity at the moment. So that would be suffering. Um, you know, I guess the people, a lot of the stress that we have nowadays is because we have too many options. And is that really worth complaining about? 
I don't know. I don't think so. You have to choose. And if you have a choice, that means that you have a wealth. And so that's kind of the way I look at it. Um, something I've been trying recently, which has been really interesting to me. I've been making mobiles. Cool. <laughs> Sweet. And, you know, I, you know, I do a little, a little artsy stuff, but it's, it's interesting because a mobile, if you set it up in a, a decent spot, it's always, it's always changing. It's always moving. And it reminds me um, to prevent, to kind of get away from my perfectionist tendencies, which would be, I have this thing figured out. I have this framework, this model, this situation, this relationship, whatever it happens to be. And that there it is, I've got it done. And I've done the last little chip on my sculpture and now it's perfect. And the mobile is constantly spinning and rotating and showing me new interactions and new perspectives and new ways to look at it. And it's always changing within a framework of the same thing. So it's just a reminder to me to don't try to get locked into one. Okay, now I've got it figured out. Because um, part of the joy is the potential of the yin, which is hasn't hasn't formed yet. So that's just some thoughts. The yin formed possibilities. Mm. Um, thanks, Scott, and and thank you for 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 visiting, um, Mr. Carranza. Um, good morning and uh, happy new year. Um, I got my second Shingrix or shingles vaccine. Um, and it was predicted I would get a fever and I did. <laughs> so I'm taking it easy and listening, um, from some conversations Tuesday, I was thinking about a connection game or what an OGM game would be. And basically, you know, ask, in some ways, what your values are, how much time you're going to spend in connection with other people, and um, you know what a point system for hours spent in conversations in a group, hours spent one on one, um, or maybe you know partial hours um, spent. And um, you know, there's so many people on this call that. I've yet to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with, and uh, certainly um, a number, quite a number who I have. And um, uh, yeah, it was kind of like, okay, where, what's the intention? How do we track it? Is tracking it um, something that can be fun and kind of like something that gives an insight in some kind of way? Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll continue playing with it for a little while. But anybody interested, yeah, please connect with me. That's it. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Hey, Mark, I, I have a little comment on that from something I discovered about a year, and year and a half ago. Um, that I realized that most of my interactions with other people were not synchronous. I had, I had flipped to mostly asynchronous time. And by that, I mean, if I'm reading someone's something that someone wrote, or I'm watching a video of someone, that was produced at a different time. However, right at this moment, we have 15, 10, whatever people um, who are all in the same time at the same time. And so there's, it's, a, it's a limit. The limiter. You can only spend so much time in in the same time with someone, and we create this. It, it felt dishonest to me at that point. And and let me let me say this. It felt dishonest to me to think that I could get more interactions with people than the time that I was awake. In other words, I can get I can get two hours worth of interactions if I just skim really fast because I'm, I'm reading something that someone else produced or I'm watching something at a faster speed or I'm, I'm multitasking in that sense. And then I can't actually stack more human one-on-one -on -one synchronous time. It, it doesn't scale. 
you can only and well it, and so the theory mm -hmm. was like i can i can interact with 10 hours worth of of human content production in three hours if i skim if i scan if i go faster and that's how most people are interacting with the world most of the time because it's inefficient to interact with groups in the same space one on one and yet it's it's richer so that was just a, a thought um could you go a little deeper with the and yet it's richer there is a back and forth there is a context that comes with it there's a space in between there um when you when it's all inhale there's no exhale there's no opportunity to really think about what it was that you just heard hmm. um, and that happens in this in this space sometimes is we'll just go from subject to subject to subject and wow doug just said something really profound and then we'll move on to the next thing because we're constrained in our time and and the gift of of being one on one or being in the same space is I will, so you asked, yes, about richer. Um, it's, it's interesting. That's a, that's a good question. I don't have a great answer for that. It felt more, like I had said, it felt more honest to me hmm. because this is the amount of interaction time that I have with, and I can either do it asynchronously and pretend that I'm stacking productivity, which, okay, yeah, I can do that. But am I really, um, I don't know, am I really interacting fully with others or not? And, and so that, and maybe the word fully is a hint. It just felt like it was richer when I was having that synchronous time with people. There was just something, something different qualitatively. This sounds like what's usually described as quality time. Yeah, yes, yes. And, and maybe that maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's it's that we are existing in the same, doing the same thing at the same time. Doesn't matter if we're in the same space. You know, you people are all over the place. Who knows where you are? But right at this moment, we are all in this little space of you know, this little time window. And we're sharing that. And we haven't given it to someone else. And that's, it's just interesting about how that connects. Like when I'm watching someone's YouTube video, I can look all over the place. I can be doing other stuff. I can put it on a high speed. I don't care because mm -hmm. I'm not insulting them. I'm not, there's no, you know, there's no reciprocation that I have to provide from a social uh feedback standpoint which is why it can be difficult to make videos as jerry would know probably like to your phone like okay i'm going to tell you about this deep important thing and i can't see anyone so i don't know if i'm getting any feedback so different so different yeah yeah and you know i i had said to the the metacogs group it was a while ago that i noticed that i when i'm talking about something if i have a bunch of faces who are not even saying anything it changes what i say changes how i say it and I could be talking about something with no response verbally in my living room, sitting on my couch, just talking to myself, which is kind of what I'm doing right at this point. And it would be totally different. It would be much less rich. But by looking around, scanning, I'm seeing, okay, some people are, some people are leaning in. They're very interested. It's like, okay, what does that do to me? That makes me think that this is interesting. And then I think, why is this interesting? And it, it feeds back on myself and it just gets really rich because um, you are giving me that space to think aloud. One thing that I would love to do is mix it up. So say, you know, every fourth meeting, everybody turns the radio off and it's just voice. It's like a phone call. Um, Doug. Isn't that called Clubhouse? <laughs> okay. Uh, I actually this was a phone call with somebody yesterday. It was very strange and wonderful. You could call it a Clubhouse emulation mode. 
Um, go ahead, Doug. Okay, just, I think that part of human development is what happens when two people are looking at each other and what one person says stirs up every neuron in the body of the other. And you can see that happening. So when you're talking with somebody, you're affected by the fact that you're affecting them. If you break that loop and turn it into just input without output, I think the brain really suffers in its development. And that's a real problem. Uh, even in Zoom, there's some advantages to the, all the faces on the screen, but there's some disadvantages by not having the whole body. Uh, there's certainly, uh, for example, where there's no smell of each other that there, I think, is in real face-to-face -face conversations. And the striking thing to me is that human development is based on all of our brain, all of our neurons, all of our hormones involved in each conversation. And if we break that into pieces, we're probably breaking up our uh, human development. Thanks, Doug. Uh, Stacy, and then me. You're muted. Although the gestures are really good. So I, <laughs> <clears throat> I, I was trying to hear what you're saying. Skill, so I got thrown off for a minute. Um, I wanted to, so yes and no to what Doug was just saying. So I, I'm definitely one of these people. I like to look at somebody's face. I like to see everybody's reaction. That being said, there's another time where a phone conversation or not seeing the person and really tuning into that energy with your other senses, there's something there, you know, we forget we have other senses and it goes beyond the five. And Mark, you have a great voice. So that's why you like having the voice. <laughs> that's it. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, Stuart and me. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'm thinking of The Voice, the TV show, The Voice, uh, where people are just focused on um, the quality of what the voice uh, is, is expressing. And also the, the whole notion that um, it goes back to the, I can't remember the word, um, egro something or other, where we're, we're part of a larger uh, organism. And th that's what it is when we have all of this stimulation right um there's something energetic about it there's something um physics like about the 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 connections and the movements and the micro movements that that we we impact each other like like that um somebody's content the content of their of their of their articulation is some way going to be impacted by who you think about them and what the visual is that they present, I, you know, so it's, it's, um, it's a, it's a comp complex thing, but we grow and are part of some level of a bigger whole by the interaction that comes up. It's like, I used to refer to it as third body. One plus one equals something that's up here someplace. It's what love relationships uh, uh, are about. Um. Love that. A, a couple of thoughts, several that you just triggered uh, right now, Stuart. Um, and I'll just put my notes in the chat. So in barbershopping, there's something called the bird. So barbershop quartet is for men singing. For women, it's called Sweet Adelines. Uh, but when the group is in really good harmony, you hear an overnote, an overtone called the bird. Mm. Um, and I think that there's probably equivalents in other kinds of musical settings, but that's the only one I know about. Uh, and it's and it's it, maybe that's a, a piece of what you're you're thinking about also, but in some other dimension because what you're talking about is, uh, I like to talk about aha conversations, and I started Jerry's weekend retreats with people with whom I was holding aha conversations where by speaking together somehow we had built something together that wasn't there in either of our heads beforehand, and it was a, like a a lovely product of our interaction uh, in the moment. So so I love all those things. Uh, somewhere I read ages ago that Leibniz corresponded with over 600 people during the enlightenment during his career. And I'm like, I send emails to 600 people like in a couple of days every week, like, like the speed and, and scale of our communication cap capacities right now is insane. And, and Leibniz had to sit down with Quill and Ink and wait a couple months and hope that the messenger 
uh, you know, whether it was like horse plus ship plus whatever made it to the other end and then wait for a thoughtful reply. And then someone might actually take a month to sit down and think about the question, write out an answer. And blah, blah, blah. who knows, like, like the pace of our, of our thinking together is so, so vastly different uh, than it has been in kind of in, in any previous era. We have this instantaneity, which creates this incredible flood. So the info torrent uh, is, is gigantic. And, and part of our battles individually, and we've, we've heard a bunch of it here about going someplace special, turning off socials, uh, Gil, you and Ken Homer getting off of Facebook and all, all that kind of thing is our attempts to cope and manage the info torrent. Um, and for me, coping with the info torrent and being focused is a polarity that I try to manage. And uh, so, so I, I, don't, I don't think that people are not multitaskers. I think that we, we, we don't have a really, really good multitasking interface. So we're crappy at it because it's so hard to do. Uh, but if somebody optimized for like, and the image I have here is Bruce Lee uh, being attacked by six people simultaneously. It's like, here's, in, here's a lot of incoming things. And if I can bend this one over and forward it to the right subset of people, and if I can post something about it with a comment over here, and if I can reshare this and like this, like that act of being in, in the torrent, but very quickly doing the right things quickly and feeling like, like you've done a tremendous amount and then setting that aside, switching your brain, switching your context and going into deep, slow focus mode to actually pay attention and to do something else, that seems to me to be really important. And, and, and so when I, read a, when I read some article about how people are terrible multitaskers, you should only serial task, I'm like, well, no, actually, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not buying uh, that kind of thing. Gil, go ahead and then I'll, I'll step back in. Um, yeah, what we're describing was feeling to me like a keto practice where it's not like being in the torrent and then going somewhere else to be still, it's learning to be still in the middle of the torrent. Unless you can find that stillness, you're gonna get squashed. So in, in Aikido is my sport. And in Aikido, there's a thing called randori where everybody runs at you and you basically sort of throw them aside and step around and you try to throw people into the path of the next person who's attacking you because that is actually pretty helpful. Uh, but but a, a big piece of Aikido is being aware that the one person you're dealing with isn't the only person who might be present. Uh, and Aikido, again, is not about attacking people. It's about defending yourself. It's a defensive martial art. Uh, and it's metaphorically very rich in terms of strategy and other sorts of things. Go ahead, Gil. But I'm, 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 I'm speaking to, the, to a deeper layer than the technique of, I mean, you know, yes, you know, not, don't get hung up on one attack or throw one into the other, all that stuff. There's moves to do, but it only works if you can find your own center. Right. Your own space in this, because as soon as you, as soon as you feel the fear, you lose your ability to move. And the key in Aikido is chi. So uh, do is the way, the path. I is harmony. So Aikido is the way of harmony with universal life force or chi. Um, and there's a bunch of energetic, semi-spiritual work in Aikido a little bit. And the founder of Aikido had a whole spiritual background that that i don't know very much about um well, also, yeah. some, with some of the most practical woo, woo i know it has saved my life on the freeway any number of times there you go uh, there was an aikido practitioner named george leonard who uh uh was in san francisco and one of my regrets in life is not having attended some of his classes before he passed away so uh he seemed like a really extraordinary human to get to know um a couple other things just by way of check-in um the idea of weaving and what Wendy said earlier about you know, like, like doing more weaving. Um, so there's like so much weaving in my life right now in different metaphorically in different ways. And so um, the Weaving the World podcast that we're busy sort of standing up and Stacy has been helping me a whole bunch, including uh, a whole bunch of focused effort to, tra to uh, uh, transcribe uh, an interview that I did with Daryl Davis, which will it'll show back up in, in our community once we produce that and so forth. But um, the podcast, the idea of the podcast was to have these shadow episodes that I was calling composting uh, sessions or something like that. And composting is a smelly, not that great metaphor, even though the idea is to break things down and to find the nutrient value and enrich them again and sort of uh, you know enrich the soil to amend the soil with 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 healthy organic thoughts. 
Um, so I'm, I'm now borrowing from uh, open street maps, which through mapping parties, and this is before the day when all of us were carrying GPS enabled smartphones around. So they would get people who had uh, GPS, you know, Garmin's and other kinds of devices that had GPS on them. They'd pull them together in some town somewhere, uh, teach the newbies what to do, send everybody off on a route and then come back together and upload all the data to the OpenStreetMaps database. And, and it was a form of really fun. You'd learn something new, you'd collaborate. And in the end, you would have mapped some part of your, of your environment. It was really cool. And some parts of Germany are so well mapped that every bush and tree is like lat long marked on a layer of open street maps. It's really, it's really interesting how productive that could be. So I was thinking, what do weaving parties look like? And I'm not sure what weaving parties look like. And I could use some help thinking this through because I know what my, you know, so what my behavior looks like when I'm sitting on a call is this. So here's, here's, here's the note for today's call. Here are all the call. Here's every call we've had in OGM uh, uh, on Thursdays. Uh, here is the poem that Stacy read, which was already in my brain. Here's John O'Donohue, who's a poet, who also wrote uh, Bernacht, which was recently on Poem of the Day, I think. Um, uh, and, and so a lot of the topics, here's Shingrix, Resistance to Change, uh, We've Been Suffering from a Young Overdose, Ministry for the Future, Yin and Yang, et cetera, et cetera. So I know, I know what I do to weave during a call. This is my, my loom. This is how I weave. And I publish this and anybody can go wander it. And a couple people do, not a lot. I don't know what it's like when different people with different tools come together and try to do that together and make a bigger artifact. And I think that's part of what Wendy uh, was talking about earlier. It's like, it's like, what does it look like when we're weaving actively together? And I'm, I'm extremely interested in that question. Um, we had a call, uh, we had one OGM call that I called a hoedown a while ago. And in the hoedown, we picked a topic and it was something climate change related. And then five of us, I think, were using different tools. Me and the brain, uh, Robert Best and Mind Manager, I think. Uh, somebody was on Miro, et cetera. And then at the end of the call, we compared notes with how we'd use each of our tools on the same topic, which was interesting. And I just didn't go back and repeat that. Probably could have turned that into its, into its own sequence of let's get better at that. And that'll teach us what this weaving thing is. But I'm trying to figure out what weaving is. And then second thing by way of check-in, I forwarded to the list um, Unfinished 21, which is a sweet conference in Romania. I story threaded it with uh, a, an illustrator named Emma Schmidt. And she and I basically uh, listened to a bunch of recordings of sessions, which would be the normal sessions in a conference. And then she and I did riffs on it, on what we heard in those sessions. And story threading is a, a practice I'd like to stand up. If anybody thinks they'd like to be a story threader, let me know, because I think that would be really interesting to, to, to create that as a practice. The same way that today you can go hire a graphic facilitator for an event, I think that you should be able to hire one or more story threaders for an event or a meeting or a whatever. And so story threading is finding, sort of weaving through the nuggets of shiny insight that show up in meetings. And in particular, story threaders have a, a, an opposite or an orthogonal mission to graphic facilitators, meaning graphic facilitators job usually is to faithfully capture and render visually what's actually being said in the meeting as best they can. They're, they're, they're trying to capture the essence of what in fact got said. Story threaders have the mission to look around and see what, what great bright thing fell to the ground and was lost on the cutting room floor, except they picked it up and turned it into a narrative. And story threaders have full permission to bring their own perspective and ideas into that conversation to then weave those em embers into some interesting storyline, some new narrative that might have gotten lost. So they have kind of this broadening uh, role or, or mandate in meetings. And that's, again, just trying to stand this up as a, as a practice and see where it goes. So um, I'll, I'll just stop there. Uh, any thoughts about uh, wherever we've been on the call? Because we've run over our time a little bit. And uh, Scott, about anxiety. Um, yeah, I was cool. just fleshing out a little bit of the things that Mark had asked because I didn't think my answer was complete. And I went back and found in my brain some of the comments that I had written for myself. Awesome. Uh, 
Awesome, thank uh, the, you. The, the last one I think is the most interesting and relevant that I had some success with people who were struggling with anxiety. And I realized if they move to the synchronous and local instead of the asynchronous and global, it helped and it helped right away. What's here right now? And then, you know, they their breath could would start to slow and they would get a handle on it instead of worrying about infinity, which is essentially what the, the globe is for any single human, mm -hmm. it's, in, it's infinity. Um, just now, synchronous and here, what can you see? Is everything okay in your room? Yeah, actually everything's okay in my room. You know, look out the window, is everything okay out the window? Okay, yeah. And it's very easy to let ourselves be concerned with infinity, but only if you can handle it. How about that? Love that. And it was Ram Das who wrote Be Here Now back apparently in 1971. The perspective of just how small we are. <laughs> just how tiny. It's changed. Like you would think that be here now wouldn't be such a difficult thing to think about doing. It's kind of obvious. And yet here we are. So I really enjoy be there yeah. then. Be there that's, then is good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah that was, that's kind of the fun thing. Um, the uh, a cartoonist, I can't remember him, but a punk cartoonist um, had uh, a cartoon called Stick Boy. And um, Stick Boy was trying to figure out the universe and he was in a new age bookstore and one of the books was be there then. The other one, a favorite of mine, the goddess wants blood. <laughs> nice um scott i was going to bring up that as you get into more mathematics it turns out that there's an infinity of infinities uh, what people refer to as infinity is the mathematicians call all of null and there is actually all of one two etc all the way up to infinity so. damn it so in parallel lives we are even more overwhelmed than we are right now right here well, I got to wonder, you know, how do we know that we're the first? It could be the stuff has figured out, been figured out before and we're just rediscovering it. So. Can we scroll ahead to our future selves and figure out that it all turns out okay? Well, that'd be a good thought for given that it's January 6th. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Grace, you were saying something? I was saying some of our future selves are been more overwhelmed, some of our parallel selves and some of our parallel selves are... Uh, much calmer and more centered. Sitting on a beach, enjoying the sunshine. This is starting to sound like Rick and Morty. So. Mm. Yes. Um, with that, thank you all. Uh, Stacy. thank you for reading a poem in OGM. We should do that more often. Um, and let's uh, welcome to 2022. Mm. See y'all on the inner tubes. Thank you. Mm.